All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, to help with your digestion, we are talking to about today about Neutron. And exactly, we are going to talk how better it got in the past year. So I am Salvatore. The guy over there, the young guy over there, is Aaron. He's not married, if you want, you know? <laughs> 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 and we both work with VMware. As you know, VMware is very evil. We want to sell you a lot of proprietary stuff. And for this reason, today we are going to talk to you about how good the open source bits got into OpenStack Neutron, allegedly. So, what happened in the past year? So, a lot of code in the past 12 months, a lot of code come and went. We had like more than probably 1,500 commits. A lot of lines of code were removed. We added twice more lines of code than that. And after all that crap, did we manage to make it just a little tiny better? Maybe. So, in order to um, realize whether we actually made it better or not, I could talk here for two hours, maybe even three, about all the changes that we made. But without any numbers, it doesn't make sense. This is the same thing when somebody comes to you and says, uh, Neutron doesn't scale. What the hell do you mean by scale? So, I mean, by scale, you can mean a lot of stuff. Uh, for this reason, we made um, a set of an experimental campaign where we want to measure exactly how uh, the agent, and specifically for this talk, the layer two agent scales uh, in its interactions with uh, uh, the plugin, the server side, over the uh, message queue bus, and when the load imposed by the server increases. We measure the load in terms of number of interfaces that have to be concurrently wired. So, for instance, there we have uh, you know, the agent, when it wires one interface at a time, is under a light load. When it wires 10 interfaces at the same time, the load is a bit higher. So, we measure the load both in the layer 2 agent and the DHCP agent. Basically, the layer 2 agent, you know, for configuring an interface, has to do all the wiring, like applying the appropriate configuration, applying security groups. And for the DHCP agent, has to ensure that the MAC IP association is added to the proper DNS mask configuration. So, the methodology of our analysis is uh, rather simple. We increase the number of concurrent servers being booted from 1 to 20. Uh, in, we did in step of two. I mean, we did in step of one, so, but here we are just reporting part of the results. And in order to make sure that we did not get any outliers, we repeated every experiment 20 times. So, for instance, the last experimental set, we booted concurrently 20 VMs for 20 times, with an overall number of VMs of 400 VMs. And then for each metric that we defined, we studied the mean, the variance, and the median. So, but which are the metrics that we uh, thought were meaningful? So, the metrics are three for servers, three for instances, and three for ports. Uh, valuable metric for an instance are the time that it, the instance needs to go into active state. So, you know, when you boot an instance in OpenStack, you have various states, uh, then the instance goes into spawning, and finally, it goes into active. And since uh, there is a networking component in the time to go to active, we wanted to measure what that networking component time is. And exactly, that's T allocate net. T allocate net, it's the time that Nova spends chatting with Neutron for configuring networking for an instance. And finally, the last parameter is the time needed to ping an instance. So it's the time from when I do Nova boot to when I'm actually able to ping uh, a floating IP associated with that instance. And of course, there are a lot of components involved here. There is a, a component due to sp spawning the instance. There is the other comp component for associating the floating IP. And finally, there is another component for actually waiting the instance that goes through the boot process and as networking ready. Uh, this is, for instance, if we go a little bit more into detail and look at the port, uh, metrics, we have three, time, three, three metrics which are really specific to neutron components. The first is time processing, time to process, 
to, time to wait for processing an instance, which means how much time that interface is sitting there on the integration bridge on an instance, on a, sorry, on integration bridge on a host before the layer two agent even considers the idea of wiring that port. Then the time to bring an interface up, which means how, may, how much time goes from the moment where the VIF is plugged from NOVA into integration bridge until the Neutron Layer 2 agent takes that VIF, processes it, wires it, and therefore that bridge is ready, sorry, that bridge, that interface is ready to communicate. And finally, it's time, the time DHCP, which is the time that is needed to notify the DHCP agent about the new interface and register the new interface in the NS mask. As I said earlier on, registering a new interface is pretty much adding a new entry to the host file in the NS mask. And let's go for the results, straight to results. So what you see here in the diagram is the difference in the time to go up from Havana to Juno. The red line is Havana, the blue line is Juno, thankfully. And uh, as you can see, there are also, I also added the, uh, the bars for the standard deviations, which are the pink ones for Havana and the light blue ones for Juno. So what we can say is that, well, it's a lot better. And those are not lies, those are true results. And yeah, because you, know, you might say, hey, this guy is lying, this guy just wants to tell us that Neutron is better, but actually we know that Neutron is just a huge pile of rubbish. It might be a huge pile of rubbish, but it kind of works now. So, kind of. So, what you can see is that from Havana, the Havana, well, now, now it's a year is gone, Havana is not supported anymore. We can actually say, oh man, that was really, really bad. I mean, when you went up to 10, 10 concurrent instances, it could really not wire anymore properly because the time to wire an interface started to grow up in a quadratic way, which is really not scalable. If you have like a high density server where you can have like hundreds of VMs on a single server, you can't really run the OVS agent with this. But with Juno, we have a linear trend with a, a slope which is not so bad. For instance, with 20 concurrent instances, we are still under 30 seconds for wiring all the instances. So I mean, the, like, this means that the instance it takes more time to wire, wire like in 25 seconds, which is probably not great, but it's still acceptable if you consider that you have 20 instances. Also, these tests have been run on machines which have just four cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. Not because we don't have machines. I mean, VMware can pay for us for giving us good machines for doing these tests. We just wanted to do something which could also be compared against the tests that we run in the gate, just for giving you a credible reference. The second measure is the time to allocate a network. So these measures are actually taken not in Nova, in Neutron, but in Nova. They represent the time that Nova spends talking with Neutron for doing all the API calls for uh, uh, allocating a network. So this is where you know my friend Aaron here did a very good job. He mostly did all the patches that allowed us to bring this time down. And you know and. The interesting thing is that the trend, the growth trend of the of the line for Havana, for, for Juno is just less than a sixth of the growth trend that it was for Havana. So the scalability is a lot better. I, I put in this diagram also the median for a, a, a ver, for a consideration that the difference between the mean and the median in Havana was huge, while you know they are pretty much the same in Juno. The difference here is uh, ML2. ML2 had in Havana bad database locking problems, and the median, the, the mean, is really skewed because of some outliers, which were some particular requests, which were timing out and starving because of these locking issues in ML2. But all these problems have been now solved in ML2, and the, 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 error, the mean and the median are pretty much the same thing. Finally, I have one last diagram for you. This time is a bar diagram. And the bar diagram reports failures, which may be either VMs going in error during the boot process or VMs timing out, so never able to uh, being uh, reachable from ping. 
And uh, the, red, the, the red bars are from Havana, and you can see we can see quite a lot of failures for Havana, like uh, over a quarter of instances failed, failed when we run 20 concurrent instances. And uh, the blue bars are the failures that we observed in Juno. Aaron, where are the blue bars? Um, there. Yeah. Well, we actually saw absolutely no failures in our test when booting instances concurrently with Juno, which is a good result. Actually, the problem that led to all these timeout failures in, uh, in Havana is a, a, a very simple problem that since Nova and Neutron were not coordinated, basically any Nova will start booting an instance and the network was not yet ready. What happened is that, you know, the instance then tries to get an IP, the network is not ready, the instance say, well, I don't care about it anymore, I, I don't want an IP anymore, and it's not reachable. So this is something that has been fixed by Aaron in cooperation with Dan Smith from the Nova Core team, and now we have not just Neutron, which scales a lot better than what it used to scale in Havana, but it's also an awful lot more reliable. Still, I mean, I agree, it's far from being perfect, but at least you can stop throwing, <laughs> throwing stones at it. Maybe, probably. I'm sure there are a lot of things that still don't work. And yeah, so let's analyze a little bit the progress together. So, I think when, when we started with Folsom, you know, we didn't even have an engine, probably, a proper engine to Neutron. It was more of a pedal thing. Then, yeah, Grizzly started to work somehow. Havana was probably just good to sell through it or to, the, you know, to go around with the three wheels. Icehouse, I think Icehouse was really reliable, but probably slow. Instead, you know, with Juno, we got a nice and comfortable, reliable Toyota Camry. It's not fast, it's not shiny, but at least, you know, it's reliable. Like, you can do like 100,000 kilometers or even 200,000 kilometers with it. And so this is pretty much a good analogy, I think, of the evolution that we need for uh, the open source components that are running within Neutron. So before, uh, so this is just a summary of uh, the improvements that we made. Uh, I think we pretty much already discussed all of them. Uh, before on, going on, I just want to mention that we, in this analysis, we just looked at the layer two agent. We've done analysis also for uh, uh, improvements in the layer three agent, but unfortunately, we had to select what to talk about in this presentation. But even the L3 agent, we did a lot of improvements, which actually brought down a lot the time needed for synchronizing the status of the L3 agent with the status of the server for wiring floating IPs and so on. Oh, one last diagram. Uh, this is the time for bringing an instance, you know, the blue line is the time for bringing an instance into the active state in Juno, and the red line is Havana. So we have a little problem here. The blue line is higher than the Havana line. So now Juno is slower than Havana. So, well, we made it worse. And it's all his fault. And now, because it's his fault, it's his task to talk and explain you why this is happening. <laughs> Come on, go, go. Cool. So, as, Sal as Salvatore was pointing out, one of the components that we added in Icehouse actually was this uh, event reporting system between Nova and Neutron. So now Nova and Neutron now talk to each other, or Neutron now talks to Nova. So if you use Horizon, I'm sure everyone's seen this problem where you associate a floating IP with your instance, and then the floating IP doesn't actually show up on the Horizon UI. So the reason why this happens is Nova uh, returns cache to IPAM information about the instance, so it doesn't automatically get updated when you associate that floating IP. And the way that it actually updates uh, that information is there's a periodic heal script that runs on all of the compute nodes. And the amount of time it takes to actually heal the cache, unfortunately, is based on the number of instances that are running on that server. So if you have 100 instances on a server, it'll take a really, really long time for that cache to get healed. So typically, what you'll see is someone who associates a floating IP with the Neutron API. Then they'll go ahead and query the Nova API. And then they'll be kind of confused why the floating IP doesn't propagate all the way to Nova immediately. So in order to remedy this problem, um, Whenever a floating IP is associated with Neutron, Neutron then informs Nova um, to heal its cache. So what would happen is someone goes ahead and associates a floating IP to Neutron. Neutron then tells Nova API, 
API, hey, this instance uh, uh, changed, then that gets dispatched to the compute node, and the compute node then goes ahead and heals the cache. As you can see in the system, um, we're kind of dispatching the event all the way to the compute node, so one of the things that we might uh, try out is actually pushing this logic a little bit higher into Nova API so we can do this uh, quicker. Um, another, so when you query Nova API now, now you see the floating IP, and it's done a lot quicker than it used to. Another problem that Salvatore was pointing out is in the gate, we would see oftentimes where you would boot a server but the, or boot an instance, but the network yet isn't ready for that instance. And unfortunately, some of the DHCP clients and the guest will attempt a couple times and then give up. So what would happen is you would go ahead and boot an instance. Um, you would query Nova. It would say it was ready. But then you would actually try and SSH into the instance, and nothing would work. The network wasn't already ready for it. So we leverage the same event framework that we use to update the cache in order to solve this problem. So now the workflow internally, what happens is a user goes ahead and talks to Nova API to boot an instance. That gets pushed to the scheduler. The scheduler then uh, dispatches that to one of your compute nodes. And the instance is started in pause state, and the network is actually attached to the instance. So then what happens is Neutron goes ahead and wires the network um, whenever that happens. And then the back end to Neutron will then notify uh, the Neutron API uh, that the port is updated is now in active status. So whenever the database um, status changes from like, down to active, then Neutron API then tells Nova API that the port is now plugged. And then Nova Compute will unpause the VM. So the VM will come up with active status with a working network. Um, these are controlled via these settings. Uh, some plugin implementations in the back end aren't able to expose an operational status, or it might take a really, really long time for uh, the port to get wired. So these are the flags that you can use to tune the timeout, or you can even disable it if you want. And this actual event system that's used in Nova is actually going to be used for Cinder and several other things. So things don't have to pull as much. They can get notifications when something changes. And in fact, Congress is actually looking at using the same system. And if anyone's interested in hearing more about that, there's actually a design summit at 440 in uh, room 124. So I don't know. You ready to vouch that this thing actually works? Yeah. You ready to swear it? Am I no, it actually works because indeed it has actually been running in the gate for already six months. So it's been running in the gate. It's been running in uh, a few production de deployments. So this event reporting system is apparently apparently a bit re reliable. I have to say we have to fix a few bugs into it for IceHouse. So we can say that now for Juno is really like 100 <laughs> percent. No, sorry, not 100 <laughs> percent. Like 90, 90 something percent reliable. So. And beyond doing this, uh, this increases a lot the reliability of Neutron. When it comes to scalability, we had to work on the Layer 2 agent. The Layer 2 agent, uh, it, the problem that, that it was terribly slow in f wiring interfaces. Wiring an interface is a process that involves e detecting the interface on the integration bridge. It involves associating an appropriate uh, configuration to that interface on the bridge so that it gets into the same broadcast domain, which is uh, for that, the tenant network to which the interface belongs, belongs, and then applying security groups to it. Security groups, in the case of the layer two agents, are applied through IP tables. So it means just applying the relevant IP tables rules. So the problem is that there was an in, in the interface with the server was not really efficient because for fetching the interface detail, we fetch details one by one. So if you had like a burst of 20 new interfaces, we made 20 calls to the server. At the time of Havana, the server, RPC server, on the Neutron server was not even multi-threaded or did not allow to have multiple workers. So this became a serial process. So we optimized it, one, by allowing multiple workers on the RPC API interface, and two, by bulking 
the request for retrieving interface details. So if you add the six new interface to wire, we ask for, in a single API call, for the details for six interfaces. Then there was a, another behavior really annoying that the security group calls were preemptive. So I was processing an instance, it came a burst of security group update requests, and that burst of security update requests starved the whole process for wiring instance. Uh, since the ML2 plugin in Havana was also sending uh, update requests like crazy, so it was sending an update port request even if the port was not updated at all. So this caused like a burst of, uh, uh, of requests that the agent had to process, and it preempted, it preempted uh, normal interface wiring. Then another problem that we had is that even if we have OVSDB, which is a very smart thing and can tell you exactly what's changing on the bridge, nevertheless, we kept pulling it like, you know, like ships. You, know, you have something very smart that you can use it, and we kept using the dumb thing. Uh, and also, we also did a kind of superficial analysis of devices to process. You can read there, the software was so dumb that kept wiring the same interface over and over and over and over, it just in some case, not always. So we fixed a lot of things. A few things were just bugs. Uh, other things required a bit of re-architecting of the L2 agent. For instance, instead of having uh, the L2 agent add like uh, this mechanism uh, where security group calls were handled in a different queue than, uh, uh, well, were not handled at all in a queue, were handled just different thread, in different threads from the main uh, port winding calls. Now we have like an event loop. Uh, an event queue. Everything is added to this event queue, regardless of where, from where it's coming from, so that it gives you like predictable uh, processing times. And you, in theory, we are not doing that yet, but in theory, you could also now have multiple servers processing uh, elements from the queue, so that you can actually do uh, parallel processing in a safe way. And well, we fixed security uh, updates for security groups. And most importantly, we started leveraging the OVSDB monitor. The OVSDB monitor tells us exactly when there has been an event on the OVS bridge. So we just, if there is no new interface wired, we don't keep polling it for no reason. We just uh, start processing interfaces when they're actually available on the OVS bridge. And another thing that was really important for using Neutron at scale is that security group were not really working beyond a, a certain sky scale, mostly because the payload for the messages exchanged by the server and the layer two agent growth, uh, had an exponential growth. So this was really a problem in the design of the communication protocol. And this was fixed by Miguel Angel. Are you in the room, Miguel? Are you anywhere in this room? Oh, disappointed, I expected him to be in the room. So Miguel uh, did this uh, analysis on his blog, and this is the difference with the new RPC, which is the blue one, compared with the old one, which is the red one, when the number of ports increases. You can see that uh, this is just with um, security, a security group with the basic rules like you know, the default security group. And you can see that with the old RPC, the size of an RPC message went easily like half a megabyte. And the time for processing, uh, for processing an RPC uh, like, likewise, add an exponential growth. So now you can imagine, this is just for 40 ports. Imagine something like the Nova default security group, which is applied to all, basically, in most cases, all the ports in your deployment, which can be easily thousands of ports. Imagine the time that will be required in the case for processing these messages. Thankfully, this has been uh, sorted as well in Juno. So we are much happy about that. And if you have, uh, want more detail about this particular announcement, you can, uh, that's, that's the link to Miguel's blog where he describes everything in detail. So let's move uh, away from the layer two agent and let's discuss a bit the improvement in the layer three agent. So one problem that we had here is that it takes quite a lot of time to processing a router. So if you created a router, added the router interface, it might take a few seconds, quite a few seconds, before you could 
actually use that router interface. If you created a floating IP, you got your floating IP back, but that floating IP was not yet working because it was not yet wired. So we changed a little bit the logic for router synchronization tasks uh, using the same principle that we did for the layer 2 agent using a priority queue. In this case, we are already processing elements in separate threads. So you have all the changes for uh, no, all the messages for router updated are added to an event processing queue. The other side of the queue, there are like different worker threads, and uh, every worker thread picks and pulls an event from this queue. And this has greatly reduced the uh, um, router processing times. Another thing that has helped uh, processing routers' time is fully leveraging the concept of IP namespaces. IP namespaces are fully isolated, and therefore, also, the IP table stack on each uh, namespace is isolated. Therefore, when you are applying IP tables in a namespace, you don't need a global lock. You just need a lock relative to the namespace where you're operating. This little change has allowed us to apply concurrently IP tables to different namespaces. So a lot of operations which were previously serialized can now be executed in parallel. And have you used like, I think you've used, uh, most of you have used like uh, Neutron with Havana, right? Uh, so when you created a floating IP with Havana, there was a little problem. You create a floating IP, you get an object in response, and that object contains the IP address of your floating IP. But you have no idea if that floating IP is working, is not working, simply because it was missing an indication of its uh, operational status. Whether, you know, indication that will tell you whether the backend, be it the L3 agent or whatever backend you're running, has actually wired a floating IP. So we added the concept of operational status for floating IP as well. What happens is that when we create a floating agent, is initial in status down. Uh, because obviously we assume that's not being wired. Then uh, a router updated message is sent to the L3 agent. This router up updated message contains the information of the new floating IP. When the floating IP is wired, and wiring a floating IP means basically just you add the IP address information to the gateway port, and then you add the appropriate DNAT and the source NAT rules. When all of this happens, the layer 3 agent signals back the server that the floating IP has been wired, and its status goes to active. The dual process is obviously when you disassociate a floating IP, the status goes from active to down. Any error that occurs in the process, like something bad happens on the layer 3 agent, on the layer 3 agent is not available at all, the floating IP goes into an error state, which reflects this condition. So this is uh, basically it. And, uh, other, enhance, other enhancement for, I wish we had time to talk about these enhancements, but uh, they will hardly fit the time for this session. So we have multiple RPC, multiple REST and RPC API workers, which means that both on the external side, the, the RPC API, the REST API, and on the internal side, which means the message queue, we now have multiple workers, and therefore we are able to process requests in parallel. This is something which has also helped a lot with reducing the time to allocate uh, network info from Nova with the graph that we've seen before. And uh, we have better IP address recycling. So the IPAM module, which is like baked in the Neutron logic, uh, kind of did a lot of query, every, a lot of database query every time you, you allocated an IP address to, you know, those queries were meant to make sure that the information for available and allocated IP ranges were already in sync, where actually you probably don't need to do that every time. You need to do that only where your IP address pool is uh, approximating its exhaust. Uh, the IP address are close to finish. So, and that's where we do a better IP address recycling. And we have uh, reduced a lot the pressure on the database. 
Though, then another problem that plagued Neutron with Havana was uh, the error that most of you have probably seen in the logs, lock weight timeout exceeded. Lock weight timeout exceeded is actually, just to be a little bit more technical, is not a database problem, it's not a Neutron problem, it's actually a problem with Neutron not using event light in the proper way. What happens is that in the middle of a transaction, you have a part, in the middle of DB transaction, you have a particular statement, like even just a log statement, which causes eventlet to yield. If eventlet then yields to another transaction, it starts another transaction which can deadlock with the previous transaction that you executed. And this typically happens when you have the lock for update statements. Because you know maybe the previous transaction has locked the record, then yields to another transaction that wants to update the record, and that other transaction is stuck because it's waiting for the other thread to release. Uh, we have removed a lot of them. I think we've got to the point where uh, in um, under heavy workload, the occurrence of this kind of error is now to reduce to a minimum when using the ML2 plugin. We still have some of these errors uh, when you use the load balancer service plugin, uh, but those problems are being sorted out with the work that's uh, being done for load balancing in Kilo. And well, I think that's really all now. And since I have really no voice anymore, I'll let Aaron finish the presentation. Cool. So kind of in summary, that as you can see from the results that uh, we did, the L2 agent has significantly improved in scalability and performance. Um, security groups now can now be used in larger deployments, and we don't have that exponential problem because of the wire format that was being used. Uh, the, Nova and the, the Nova to Neutron interface, the communication there is now much more improved and reliable. As you can see in our tests, there are no failures booting uh, 20 or so VMs concurrently, whereas in previous times, in older releases, we would have a lot of problems there when operations were being done concurrently. Um, and we also, now the instances when they go to active state, the networking is also wired. Um, and a lot of the resources now, we've tried to improve uh, the operational status of them. So for instance, now floating IPs actually reflect if they're up or down. Still, there are a lot of problems that we have and a lot of uh, area for improvements. Um, for instance, the OVS agent and the Linux Bridge agent still pull on the bridge uh, constantly to find new VIFs. Um, we do have the new logic using OVS DB monitor to get those uh, statuses or those changes so we don't have to pull, but we haven't yet enabled that uh, by default, but that's something that we'll be doing uh, soon. Uh, the Nova and the Neutron interface is a lot better, but there's still a ton of work that has to be done there. Um, currently, if you query Nova or Nova API, that actually makes a call to Neutron. So unfortunately, if Neutron is down, that also brings down the Nova API endpoint. So that's something that we want to continue to improve and further to couple in this next release. Um, a little bit has been done around uh, improving DHCP, but that's still kind of a weak, weak point. Um, Another problem that we kind of have is even though the networking is wired, the IP information is not always propagated to the DHCP agent in time. In time. So making that uh, reflect or and have an operational status to know when the IPM information actually makes it to the DHCP agent to further improve this uh, orchestration is something that we'd like to also improve. Um, final thoughts. Things are a lot better, but are, we still have a lot of work uh, to do. Um, we still have a lot of uh, questions on how we were going to handle data plane scalability. For instance, um, if we use in the current implementation, the hybrid OVS driver uh, requires using OVS and Linux Bridge together, and that has some data plane um, ramifications and performance costs there that would, uh, we'd like to address. There are some people who are working on uh, programming OVS flows to do security groups instead of using IP tables, so that should be a good data plane uh, scalability improvement that can come. And there are some questions on maybe improving the Neutron API to be more usable um, for Nova to help improve that integration. Yeah, that would be, for instance, uh, the question like you have no, uh, with Neutron, like you are kind of forced into a topology 
where you need to have a network that go uplinks to a router and then the router as a gateway. Whereas there are a lot of application of cloud, actual cloud application like NodePool, you know NodePool that runs in the gate, where they don't give a damn about the router, the floating IP. They just will like, give me a VM that's able to do something that I can reach through the network. So this is all a matter of improving API usability so that it can be, the API can actually be leveraged by more cloud applications. So I think that it's all for today that we had. I don't see many people sleeping, so we probably did a good job. So if you, thanks for listening. And if you guys have any questions, there are three microphones, three microphones there. Thank you very much. That's, there are the microphones for the questions over there. Or, other, or you can use one. You can try and speak up if you have a nice voice. Or you can try use one of these. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted just to ask if you check these performances basically only on IPv4. Okay, I know that in Havana it's not there, but also maybe it is, would be interesting also to know what is uh, happening uh, in uh, Juno regarding this. So is the performance... You mean between IPv4 and yeah, IPv6? IPv6, yeah. So the checks that we made actually are in a way which is are basically independent of the IP versioning scheme. Because the only difference in this, in, in this workflow using IPv6 is the DHCP configuration. That either you don't do it at all if you do Slack, or you do it using RAD DVD, RA DVD if you do uh, DHCP stateful with IPv6. The wiring part on the agent, you know, for bringing the port up with the IPv6 is uh, pretty much unchanged. Obviously, there is a different part for IP tables where instead of using IP tables before, you'll be using IP table v6. We didn't do the measurements. I expect that it should be pretty much the same order of magnitude, but I won't bet on it because with Neutron, you can't never know, you know. And uh, you, you can never expect what's going to happen. So. Hi, uh, Salvatore, good talk. Uh, very simple question. You didn't specifically talk about the setup, so I take it it was uh, Neutron and uh, OVSDB directly to uh, yeah. uh, some servers, or can you elaborate on this? Uh, I, I probably did not state with enough clarity. So we try to keep a setup which is as close as possible to the one that we run by default in the gate to provide a measure for comparison. And therefore, I didn't mention this, that explicitly is the ML2 plugin with the OVS mechanism driver running the OVS neutron agent and uh, on a machine, I repeat this, I, I say this, with four cores and eight gigabytes of RAMs. Obviously, if you run, this is not a production machine, obviously. Th this is the neutron node, right? And, and yeah, just we, send it you know, for uh, focusing exclusively on a single agent, I run the server on one node and just one compute node, just to make sure that all the instances that I launched ended up on the same agent. And so that if I launched 20 instances on the, on the Neutron, on the Nova side, I got 20 ports being wired on the same uh, compute node. Uh, but what I didn't do in this test is an horizontal scale test. Because, I mean, it also involves like a lot of hardware doing this. But an horizontal scale test, I know that there are people out there that have done this kind of testing. So not testing, stress testing scale on a single node to see how the components scale, <coughs> but doing a scale test across thousands of nodes to see how the overall architecture scales, which is another interesting testing to do. I may have missed the very first slide, but um, do you have any snaps of where Icehouse is relative to Juno? Is, is all uh, the improvements in the last six months, or were there some uh, already in Icehouse? Uh, we did the measurements from Havana to Juno. We didn't do measurements for Ava from Icehouse to Juno. I mean, that is something that I, have or I still have all the infrastructure ready to do the tests. Uh, we are already have a lot more results than the one that we have here, and we are going to publish them in the next few days or weeks. But it's a good thing to do also the same kind of analysis for comparing ISAS to Juno. I mean, I have to say that uh, the largest chunk of improvements probably went in, in the period from Havana to ISAS. And then for the period from Horizon, I I saw to Juno, we stabilized a lot along these improvements. Hi, my question was more on uh, on these tests that you did for concurrency and uh, 
the various granular measurements? What kinds of tools that you use to repeat these tests? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I wanted to use OS <laughs> Profiler. That was my initial idea. I started to use OS Profiler, and I found myself so close to the meeting time that I had to do, to do, to the summit time, that I had to do something quicker. So what I do is I developed a Tempest scenario test for doing this kind of test, and it's just a Tempest scenario test that boots VM concurrently and measures the, the time, for instance, time to ping a VM, time to SSH into a VM, time to bring the VM into active. For measuring things into the agent in a reliable way, I just instrumented logging. <coughs> I instrumented logging, I fed all the logs, all the logs, I, I pushed all the logs to syslog, and then I had another process of reading, uh, extracting this information from syslog, processing this information, and doing statistical analysis, pushing all, everything into a CSV file, which I then imported in Google Docs, where I, get, I, I, I created the graphs. That's pretty much it. So it's a lot of handmade process, which I think the data analysis part, is something I can, uh, keep developing, maybe, it's probably useful. For the data collection part, I think that if I keep doing this kind of thing in the future, I'll probably switch to as profiler. Thank you. And do you think that could be integrated into the gate? Uh, uh, to integrating, look, integrating to the gate, uh, testing which is not functional is always an hard thing. Because, uh, our, because the problem is, you would like ideally to do uh, something like, uh, a gate test in which you say, if your patch is slowing down wiring time by more than 10%, then your patch is not good. The actual truth is uh, that defining a baseline for that is very hard. And also, uh, another thing is that you, a single measurement is not reliable. You need to get uh, enough measurements to have data which are statistically reliable. So you can uh, surely monitor the current uh, uh, condition uh, like in a continuous way, but not as a gating process, I think. I don't think it's a great idea to do that as a gating process. Because, you know, like uh, in some cases, for instance, Aaron did a patch that slowed down things, like, you know, increasing the time of VM to get to active. But by slowing down things, he made the software a lot more reliable. So, you know, slowing down is not necessarily a bad thing. Great talk. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is one of your chart you show that oh, but you know there's a T up or something to linear. Why? Uh, and yeah, second I, question. I, I'll, go, I'll go back to the slide and you yeah. tell me which slide are you referring to. Uh, do, 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 do. This one? Yeah, something like that, yeah. The, uh, the previous one. This one. Yeah, why, why do you know it's a linear? Uh, now, before you answer the question, the second one is uh, the, how do you handle the situation? Let's say that if there's some sort of OVS, let's say flow is not at correctly, and when you boot up a Neutron instance, right, is that waiting passively, or is doing some sort of proactive checking? So, if a, if a flow is not set correctly, uh, like, if the, you mean, like, if there is a problem, uh, like, data plane in OBS, you mean flow not set correctly? What do you mean? Right, like, uh, some flow is not added onto the, uh, some other bridges. Okay, you that. mean, like, if there is any sort of error in the wiring process, right? That's one example, yes. Yeah, so, uh, when there is an error in the wiring process, the thing is, there are errors which are caught by the OVSDB interface. And then there are OVS failures which might not be caught. Because, you know, for instance, if the OVS kernel driver crashes, for instance, that's not a failure that we catch. In that case, unfortunately, we are not able in any way to report yet that condition back to the server. Uh, but in the case where there is a failure while processing interface, so for instance, you call an OVSDB command, that the OVSDB command fails, we report, uh, we report that failure in the port status. So you will have a VM, which I guess now doesn't boot at all. Right. right, the port would go to Because if the port is not wired, the VM doesn't boot. Previously, what happened was the VM boot went to active, you wanted to use it, and bang, it did not work. Then you had to go to the Neutron API, check the port status, and you saw that your port status was down, which probably made no sense, because if, if I have no network, there are very little use cases for a, a cloud VM to, to be used, unless you are one of the kind of guy that can do everything through a VNC console. Right, the full process actually, the way that it works is in ML2, the agent will detect the port is plugged in by pulling on OVSDB, then he'll set up the flows, and then he'll send 
a message to the Neutron server saying that the port is now active. And then that will trigger the message to know if it's on pause instance. Which OVS and which kernel? It should work on any version or most modern versions. Yeah, this uh, is all done in. It's uh, okay. It's that's, whatever's that's on good, the gate. Is that what you were? That's a good question because we did this test on uh, kernel 3.2.58 for Havana, and on kernel, well, the kernel for Trusty, it's the same kernel Trusty that runs in the gate. I don't remember exactly the version. And the corresponding default OVS versions, which are shaped by Canonical. Now, it's true because there have been also a lot of improvement in OVS in the middle, and this is helping uh, a lot when we call OVS DB, because the version that we had in Havana was multi-threaded. The version that we have now is multi-threaded. So this is helping as well. So the infrastructure is helping as well. To give you an actual comparison, I actually run, a, run Havana in the environment for which it was designed, and Juno in the environment for which it was designed. But this is the, the infrastructure, let's say, the data plane infrastructure is helping as well. Excuse me. Just uh, yep. I better understand now why you removed the log for update. I thought it was for uh, Galera compatibility, but uh, now I understand why, uh, the other reason why. Uh, sorry, but why did I remove what? Uh, the, the log, log for log. update, uh, the log for update uh, call ah, okay. in SQL Alchemy. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that a, a lot of part of the code uh, was uh, Re relying on this uh, log for update to manage uh, resource, uh, resources yeah. concurrency. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it doesn't introduce a lot of um, race conditions. No, we, we, made it, we made it in a way that doesn't introduce log. Uh, we changed the code in a way that if we could rely, rather than relying on log for update, if we could rely on database integrity for ensuring uh, the same kind of behavior, we did it. Uh, in no case we implemented, the, we needed a solution for distributed locking. Uh, we, in other cases, we went to an um, optimistic approach, which means if you do an operation that when you normally need to lock, it's because you are competing for a resource which can be taken by somebody else. In that case, if the resource that you want on the database is used by somebody else, you'll end up having an error, an integrity violation error from the database. And so what are we doing now? If you get an integrity violation error while trying to retrieve an IP, for instance, what you do is, oh, sorry, somebody took the IP before me, and you try again. So we've added a retry mechanism, which to an extent you say, oh, well, you're retrying. It's not good. I mean, it's much better to have like a sort of consensus if you want. But that would have implied adding some form of distributed locking. And when you come to distributing computing uh, constructs, like this, even just simple distributed locking, either you do it good or you don't do it at all. And so we decided the decision was whether we need to use, start using something like memcached or using something like Zookeeper to have proper distribution across multiple API workers or just multiple threads, or do the retry mechanism. The retry mechanism, I can say it's a bit pedestrian if you want, but it works. And we prefer that, at least for the release cycle, while we think how we should do proper distributed coordination. And just, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but this is what all the other OpenStack projects right. do. Uh, any more questions? Apparently not. Three, two, one, zero. Thank you very much, and have a good day. <laughs>